We're going to move to the second speakers. We, this is uh, Jörg Jewiller, is that right? Um, from uh, Basel University. The organizers, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation to this exciting meeting. Today I would like to speak about strategies which we use at the University of Basel to characterize and optimize the pharmacokinetic properties of many nanoparticulate drug delivery systems. Is it better now? Yeah. And in particular, I would like to speak of the use of zebrafish larvae as a vivo vertical screening tool. So in the development, I think in the research, we are increasingly confronted with a variety of new nanoperms. This includes viral vectors, lipid-based systems such as liposomes, LMPs, protein therapy, polymer-based nanoparticles, <laughs> <laughs> And inorganic, ah, this is a good one. <laughs> and inorganic nanoparticles for diagnostic purposes or technical applications. They have all in common that they have very specific and special physical chemical properties, in particular, a huge uh, uh, surface area, specific surface area, and they're characterized by complex interactions with biological systems. And here as keywords, I would like to mention opsonization or interactions with cells of the immune system. This makes it extremely difficult to extrapolate from frequently used cell culture models, cell-based test systems to in vivo test systems, to higher animals such as rodents, or second talk species, and ultimately to the human being, that means volunteers in clinical trials. Now in this project, our goal was to use zebrafish larvae as a vertebrate screening model to bridge the gap between the in vitro and the in vivo world. Why zebrafish? Zebrafish is a small tropical freshwater fish it is characterized by a rapid development of the embryo from the fertilized egg to a small larvae within three days. The larvae, which are hatching from the small eggs, have a size of about one to two millimeters. They're very small and they're transparent, which amends them to analysis by optical methods. These small larvae are fully developed small organisms. They have a fully developed nervous system. They have a fully established blood-brain barrier, for example. They have a closed uh, vascular system. They have functioning pronephrons, the analogs of the kidneys. And they're frequently used in development biology and toxicology as test animals. And for these reasons, there are tens of thousands of different transgenic fish strains or mutant fish lines which can be used in research. From a regulatory point of view, these small organisms have a regulatory status of a cell culture model because they're not yet considered to be autonomous animals. With respect to the vasculature and the transgenic animals, I have here an example of a transgenic animal which expresses GFP in the vasculature. We have here the small beating heart, and we have the blood which flows through the artery, and we have here in the tail region the dorsal artery, and which drains back through the cardinal vein. We have here the intersegmental vessels, and we have here the anastomotic blood vessels. So looking at the, pail, at the tail, the blood comes from the heart, flows through the artery, and then returns back to the heart through the veins, here to the venous system. <coughs> the 
Now we are interested to perform pharmacokinetic experiments with these small organisms. And therefore, it's mandatory that we have techniques to inject defined doses of our test compounds intravenously into these organisms. Our test compounds are nanoparticles, they are fluorescent labeled, and we're using micro manipulators and the very fine capillary, glass capillary, which is inserted in the duct of Cuvier to directly inject these small particles intravenously. And subsequently, we can use confocal microscopy technologies to study the circulation and tissue distribution of the injected nanoparticles. I would like to show you a first example on how we are using this technology. And here we have tested homologous series of liposomes, which were fluorescent labeled. These were phosphatidylcholine-based liposomes, which were characterized by different types of conjugated fatty acid chains. They have different chain lengths and different degrees of saturation. They all had the same size of about 100 nanometers, a polydispersity index below 0.2, so they are monodisperse. They have a very similar, slightly negative setter potential. However, they greatly differ with respect to their lipid phase transition temperature. For the arachidonoyl phosphatidylcholine, which is four times unsaturated, we have, for example, a transition temperature of minus 70 degrees. And we're moving here to DAPC, which is fully saturated. We have a phase transition temperature of plus 66 degree. So this was the main difference. And the question, of course, is if these difference in phase transition temperature have an impact on the circulation, on the pharmacokinetic property of these lipid-based drug delivery systems. And this is the result of uh, this experiment. So we had the zebrafish larva, we had the fluorescent labeled liposomes, they were intravenously injected. The injection volume is between one and three nanoliter. The total blood volume of such a small larva is 16 nanoliters. So minute amounts of the test compounds were injected and we have here the APC, the fully saturated. And if you're looking at the tail region of the fish, you can see this punctuated staining tectron, which is indicative of a very short half-life in the circulation and cellular uptake by phagocytotic cells of these particles. And here we have the DAPC, which is four times unsaturated and a completely different picture. We have a long circulation half-life distribution throughout the vasculature and a long half-life in the circulation. So apparently, depending on the phase transition temperature, we have huge differences with respect to the circulation and extravasation of these particles in vivo. Semi-quantitative image analysis indicates uh, it can be used for a quantitative assessment of these results. We have here a circulation factor, which can be uh, calculated or extravasation factor, and you can well appreciate that there are statistically significant differences between the two liposomal formulations. Now, can we extrapolate from the zebrafish to higher vertebrates? Yes, this is possible. Here we performed a series of experiments, pharmacokinetic experiments in the rat. We have again our two DAPC based liposomal formulation with the low phase transition temperatures for the flexible membrane, and here the DAPC with the high phase transition temperature, the rigid particles. A long half life in the circulation, a high AUC small clearance of this preparation, and as we have observed it in the zebrafish, in an analogous way, here a short half-life, a high clearance of these more rigid particles with a high phase transition temperature. So we fully confirm in the red the results which we have observed in the zebrafish. The differences with respect to T-half and AUC are more than five-fold between these two liposomal preparations. 
Now we have seen in these experiments that nanoparticulate systems have a tendency to be taken up by cells of the reticular endothelial system, tissue resident, macrophages, or scavenger endothelial cells. In higher vertebrates, these cells are located in the liver, in the liver sinusoids, uh, and they are comprised of Kupfer cells, tissue resident macrophages, and the mentioned scavenger endothelial cells. Now in the teleost, the anatomy is slightly different. These cells of the reticular endothelial system are located in the tail region of the fish in the cardinal vein. And as a consequence, if we have cellular uptake, as we have seen in the previous slides, we have accumulation of our nanoparticles here in the cardinal whale in the tail region of the fish. Now in this experiment, we use the transgenic fish line, which expresses GFP in the macrophages. So these are the green cells. And two types of liposomal formulations were DII labeled red and were intravenously injected. We have liposomes which are decorated with PEX 350, uh, incomplete steric stabilization, and here the counterpart, sterically, fully sterically stabilized liposomes. As you can appreciate, the partially protected, pegylated liposomes with the short PEX chain accumulate in the macrophages. We have a very nice co-localization whereas the fully sterically stabilized liposomes have a long half-life in the circulation and escape the phagocytotic process by the macrophages. Now, what about the scavenger endothelial cells? The scavenger endothelial cells located in the liver sinusoids have a tendency to take up negatively charged nanoparticles. This is mediated by interactions with scavenger receptors of the stabilin family. We distinguish between stabilin 1 and stabilin 2. Ambison is a lipid formulation of amphotericine. We have negatively charged particles, and these particles are known to interact and to be taken up by cells of the reticular endothelial system by these scavenger endothelial cells. So let's see how they perform in the zebrafish model, and let's see if we have similar interactions also in our model. So fluorescent-labeled ambizone was injected intravenously in the zebrafish, and these are experiments which were uh, done in collaboration with our partners at the University of Leiden. So they had the lead. This is the laboratory of Professor Alexander Groß. After injection, we have again this particular staining pattern we have cellular uptake of our particles, and we can now inhibit the cellular interaction by co-injection of dextrin sulfate, which binds to stabilin 2 and competes for binding of the small particles. And as you can appreciate, this particular staining pattern disappears under these conditions. A second control is a recombinant fish uh, where step two is knocked out. And here again, if we inject our fluorescent labeled ambisome into this fish, we abolish this punctuated staining pattern. Interaction with the scavenger endothelial cell is disturbed and reduced. Here, another set of controls. In these experiments, we injected negatively charged liposomes, which were uh, uh, loaded with clodronic acid, which is a cytotoxic agent. They accumulate at the level of the cardinal vein, which leads to eradication of the endothelial cells and the macrophages in this region of the tail. And this can be appreciated here in these pictures. So we can poison specifically by targeting these negatively charged liposomes to this specific part of the vascular system. So 
So this leads me to the end of my presentation. Please allow me to summarize. We've seen that there are complex interaction of engineered nanomaterials with biological systems. It's extremely difficult to extrapolate from in vitro to in vivo systems. However, we are convinced that our zebrafish model is a valid and very predictive model to gap the bridge between the in vitro and the in vivo world. Parameters of interest, which we have discussed today, are circulation and extravasation of nanoparticles and interactions, the study of interactions of such nanoparticles with macrophages or scavenger endothelial cells. So I thank you very much for your attention.